Hey everyone, in our time together, we're going to be looking at the purposes of Israel as found in the Bible. So I believe we're actually going to see that there are five purposes in Scripture for Israel uh, in God's plan. Now, before we look at those purposes, we just want to lay a little bit of groundwork. When we're talking about Israel in the Bible, we're talking about Israel as an ethnic, national, territorial entity. We're talking about uh, the nation that stems from the patriarchs, from Abraham, uh, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, we also want to note, too, that Israel is an elect and chosen nation. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6 says that the Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. So there is a sense in which Israel as a nation is elect and chosen. That's affirmed uh, in Romans chapter 11, verses 28 to 29, where, where Paul says that from the standpoint of God's choice, that they, Israel, are beloved for the sake of the fathers. And then he goes on to say, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. So that goes to show you that even as we transition uh, to the New Testament and we see uh, the work of the ultimate servant of Israel, who is Jesus the Messiah, that national Israel remains significant because the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Uh, we also want to know, too, that Israel is God's chosen servant. We see that in Isaiah 41, 8, where God says to Israel, But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, descendant of Abraham, my friend. We see that in Isaiah 44, verse 1. But now listen, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. And just in case you're wondering, you see that language even in the New Testament regarding the nation of Israel, where Mary says in Luke 1, 54 and 55, that God has given help to Israel, his servant. And this is linked with what God spoke to the fathers uh, and to Abraham and to his uh, descendants forever. So what we are seeing is Israel is an ethnic, national, territorial entity. Israel is a chosen nation for a specific service and function, and Israel is also viewed as a, as a servant of God. Now, we do want to note that when it comes to Israel here, Israel is not going to be able to fulfill its mission because of the inherent worth of the nation itself. It's not like uh, Israel is perfect, Israel is sinful, uh, in, Israel has fallen short of the glory of God, to use uh, Paul's language in the book of Romans. So what we want to note here is that the fulfillment of Israel's purposes is intertwined with Jesus, the ultimate Israelite and ultimate servant of Israel. So we are seeing a both and here, and we are affirming, obviously, Jesus as the most significant of everything. You know, he's the ultimate uh, man. He's the last Adam. He's the ultimate seed of Abraham. He's the ultimate Davidic king. He's the one who brings the new covenant. He's the ultimate king. He's the ultimate savior. But what we do see in scripture is that Israel is a corporate national entity is a servant. And then there ends up being a particular servant who is a servant of Israel, who is Jesus the Messiah. And we're just noting here that the two are intertwined. And Israel ultimately will fulfill its mission uh, to the nations in the world that God has given it because of the ultimate servant, Jesus, who is the federal head and representative of Israel, who allows Israel to be everything God uh, wants for the nation to be. And we also want to assert, assert, too, that the presence of Jesus as the ultimate servant of Israel does, does not mean the non-significance of the nation Israel. Uh, there's too many times where I hear uh, or read people will say, well, I believe Jesus is true Israel. That's why I don't believe there's a future for national Israel. That's not the logic of the Bible. In this case, it ends up being a both and. Israel as a corporate national entity is sinful, cannot save itself. But Jesus ends up being the ultimate representative of Israel who dies for Israel and the Gentiles, and he is the one, according to Isaiah 49, who will actually restore Israel and also bring blessings to the Gentiles. So we just want to affirm that as we talk about Jesus as the ultimate Israelite, that does not mean the non-significance of the nation Israel, because that's not the logic that the Bible uses. We also want to note as well, when I mentioned under this key point here, that strategic for understanding God's purposes for Israel is to grasp that God's purposes for mankind include, but go beyond individual salvation and spiritual blessings. They include the earth, the earth's creatures, nations, and all aspects of human existence. God is pursuing a righteous earthly kingdom of God over creation in which God's people are in his presence. They know, they love him, they serve him with every aspect of their existence. And God's purposes involve the transformation of earth, nations, societies, culture, politics, economics, uh, the animal kingdom, and then everything else that is associated with creation and man's existence. And the reason why I say that 
It's because oftentimes in church history, most of the focus goes to how Jesus saves individuals from their sin, how he redeems them and makes them reconciled to God. And we want to affirm that that is a super important uh, reality. Uh, we are not downplaying the significance of Jesus's role as savior of individuals. But what we are saying here is that uh, God's kingdom and creation purposes include the salvation of ind individuals, but they also are much broader. Um, there is a plan for an earthly kingdom of God, the fulfillment of the Genesis 1 mandate for man to rule and subdue the earth and its creatures for the glory of God. God has a plan for Israel as a nation and then other nations as well. He's going to restore the animal kingdom. He's going to restore all aspects of society, culture, politics, economics, etc., and we have to understand that, that because God's purposes are creational and kingdom oriented, that what God is doing through Israel is also related to those dimensions. So what we are seeing with Israel and then ultimately Jesus, the ultimate Israelite, it includes salvation from sin, but it also involves the restoration of all creation. As a matter of fact, uh, in Acts chapter 3, verses 20 to 21, Peter links Jesus coming again with the restoration of all things that the prophets talked about. Now, we also want to mention, too, uh, the storyline backdrop for Israel in the Bible. Again, every, everything in the Bible has a context. And so, you know, it's going to end up being Genesis 12, where you see, you know, Abraham, then eventually Isaac and Jacob, who end up being the patriarchs for Israel, which eventually leads to uh, Jesus the Messiah. But the backdrop for Israel in the Bible is the creation and kingdom mandate for man to rule and subdue the earth and its creatures in Genesis 1. So when God creates man in Genesis 1, verses 26 and 28, man is not only to fill the earth, but he is also to rule it and to subdue it, uh, and also uh, the, the creatures of the earth and the animals and the vegetation and everything uh, that's involved with that. So man's original task uh, is that of a kingdom uh, rule over God's creation for the glory of God, of course, we know another major part of the story is going to be the fall of man, which we see in Genesis 3. So when man sins, man becomes depraved. Uh, man uh, is uh, at enmity with God. Uh, as man's not in a right relationship with God, he's not going to be able to fulfill uh, all the things that God had purpose for him. He's in need of salvation from sin. Also very significant to understanding Israel is the rise and spread of nations, as discussed in Genesis uh, 10 and 11. So with those chapters, you end up having uh, really the people groups and the nations that stem from uh, the three sons of Noah. And that ends up being very important information there. That is not flyover country. <laughs> Oftentimes people look at Genesis 10 and 11, they sell these list of peoples and they just kind of move on. That is very significant because of the spread of the people groups and the nations, uh, they are emphasized there. And then at the end of Genesis 11, that's where the individual Abram pops up, soon to be uh, Abraham. And Abraham is going to be chosen as an individual to eventually bless all the nations and the groups that were talked about in Genesis 10 to 11. So we cannot divorce the significance of Abraham and Israel from the nations that are discussed in Genesis 10 to 11, because God has a plan to save and restore the nations that are mentioned in those uh, chapters. And then another thing that we uh, want to note as well is the choosing of Abraham, because he's going to be significant. We're going to see that he has chosen to not only bring uh, about the great nation Israel, but also to bless all the, the nations and family groups of, of the earth. But we also want to note, too, that this age that we're in is not the final age for God's plans. Uh, we do believe that there is an age to come where uh, God's plans for the restoration of all things under the direct reign of the Messiah will occur. So uh, we do see dispensations and eras throughout history as God's purposes are unfolding. And we do believe that there is another era, a, a messianic reign of Jesus, the Messiah on earth, where there's going to be complete fulfillment, uh, not just of spiritual blessings uh, for, for the people and peoples of God, but for also the transformation of all creation and the earth and its creatures and, and every dimension. Now, with all of that said, let's get into the five purposes uh, of Israel that we see in Scripture. Now, I wanted to mention them all up front, just so that we don't get lost in all the details of talking about things. So what are the five purposes of Israel? Well, the first and big one is going to be is that Israel is central to God's plans to bless the world. And that's going to be the mega purpose of Israel. That's going to involve defeating of evil, the reversing of the curse on the earth, the restoration of the earth and the bringing of prosperity. It's going to also involve bringing salvation and reconciliation with God, and it's also going to involve the defeat of death. Now, that leads to the second and very, very important purpose of Israel, is that Israel is going to be the physical seed line that leads to the Messiah, who we now know as Jesus, who will save and rule the world. 
So Israel is going to lead to the to the ultimate perfect true Israelite who is uh, Jesus the Messiah, and he's going to be the one who brings spiritual salvation and also a rule over the nations of the earth and also a restoration of creation. And then a third major purpose for Israel is going to be Israel is going to be the vehicle for the scriptures. That, how God, that is how God has chosen to bring us the scriptures is through Israel. And then fourth, Israel, and this particularly pertains to the future, is that Israel is going to be the geographical capital of Messiah's coming kingdom. So there is going to be a geographical locale aspect of Israel that will be significant when Jesus returns again to rule the earth and the nations of the earth. And then fifth, there ends up being something about Israel that allows God to show his holiness to the nations. So we're going to look at a couple passages in Ezekiel chapter 20, where God is actually showing his glory and his holiness to the nations by how he deals with Israel. Now, let's get into a little bit more specifics when it comes to these purposes. Now, to mention that first purpose, Israel is central to God's plans to bless the world. In John chapter 4, verse 22, Jesus himself said, for salvation is from the Jews. And then when you look at the very strategic text of Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 to 3, Genesis 12, 2, God tells Abram, soon to be Abraham, that I will make you a great nation. And we know that nation is going to be the nation of Israel. And then we're told that in you, Abraham and Israel, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And we can't overstate how important that that uh, wording is, that statement is there, that the purpose of Abraham and Israel is to bring blessings to all the families of the earth. Now, there's going to be later verses like Genesis 18, 18, Genesis 22, 18, Genesis 26, verse 4, that will actually talk about uh, Abraham uh, and his descendants blessing all the nations of the earth. So you get families of the earth are blessed, uh, nations of the earth are blessed. Really, in the end, it ends up being every, every people group ends up being uh, blessed by what's going to be going on with Abraham. Uh, we even see this idea affirmed in Acts chapter 3, verse 25. Jesus has ascended to heaven. Peter is giving messages to the men of Israel, according to Acts 3.12. And then in verse 25, you know, Peter tells the men of Israel, it is you who are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant, which God made with your father, saying to Abraham, and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So you get the Genesis 12.3, Genesis 18.18, 18, 22, 18, the message of those early texts in the book of Genesis, and that that is still relevant. Uh, at the time of Peter's speech here, that uh, the men of Israel, uh, it is you who are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant involving the promise that in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So uh, what we see with Genesis 12, 2 to 3, with the great nation leading to the blessings of the families and the nations of the earth, is that Israel is a means and a vehicle to bless the world and the nations of the world. That's very, very important. Um, what God is doing with Israel is not only going to be for Israel. Now, a lot of the Old Testament is going to involve the nation of Israel, but we have to remember that what God is doing with Israel, even including the covenants and the promises, is not just to land at Israel with no extension after that. God is using Israel. He will bless Israel, uh, but he's also doing that as a means to bless all the people groups uh, of the earth. Now, we have to notice that it's not God's plan to make everybody Israel, but his plan is to use Israel to bless all the peoples and all the family groups of the world. And according to Genesis chapter 12, verse 7, with its statement that the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your descendants, I will give this land, the land of Israel will be significant in God's purposes for the blessing of the world. And when you come off of the, the sin of man in Genesis 3, and then the global flood of Genesis 6 to 9, and then the spread of the nations in Genesis 10 to 11, the world is a very dark place. But God is, is choosing Abraham. He's choosing Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then the nation Israel, and then the land of Israel, to, to use uh, an analogy, to be a beachhead for the take back of planet Earth. So Israel, the nation of Israel, and the land of Israel are going to be significant in God's purposes to bless the whole world and every people group spiritually and physically and material and in and materially and in every way. Um, I don't have time to read all of Psalm 67, but we do want to notice verse 7, where you have this statement that God blesses us, God blesses Israel, that what? That all the ends of the earth may fear him. Let that sink in. 
God blesses Israel as a nation so that all the ends of the earth may fear him. Again, that goes to show that Israel is a vehicle and a means for universal blessings to the ends of the earth. As a matter of fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 5 to 8, God tells Israel that Israel needs to keep his commands because if Israel obey God, because if Israel obeys God, then Israel will be in a position to bless other nations. And so in verse 5 of Deuteronomy 4, God said, See, I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do thus in the land where you are entering to possess it. So keep and do them, for that is your wisdom and your understanding. So Israel's called to keep the commands of God. And this is to be done, what, in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people, for what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God whenever we call on him? Or what great nation is there that has statutes and judgments as righteous as this whole law, which I am setting before you today? So if Israel obeys God, that allows Israel to be in a position for the nations to be attracted to the God of the Bible. And that's why uh, Israel's obedience to God uh, is so significant is because Israel is to be a witness to the nations. Now, we know the story. Uh, Israel fails in their mission in the Old Testament. We believe that when Jesus saves and restores Israel in the future and when he's ruling over an earthly kingdom, that Israel uh, actually will have a, a role of service uh, to the nations uh, as kind of the headquarters of blessings that are extending from Israel to the rest of the world uh, during uh, the kingdom of the Messiah. So we want to note that the purpose of Israel is to save the world. Now, again, we want to be clear, that can only occur through the ultimate Israelite, Jesus the Messiah. But this saving the world involves, it involves spiritual salvation, no doubt about it, but it's not only spiritual salvation. There's also to be the restoring of creation and the establishment of a righteous, just, earthly kingdom where the peoples and nations serve God in harmony. So thus, if you were to look at texts like Psalm 72 and Amos 9, and I would even say Zechariah 9, that when Messiah's kingdom blessings extend to the nations, it's going to uh, impact uh, agriculture and economics and society and culture and all those things. So what God is doing through Israel, and then ultimately the, the true Israelite, Jesus the Messiah, is really to save man and creation in every way. So it includes the spiritual, but it's not just the spiritual. And then second, you know, as we've mentioned, uh, the second main purpose of Israel in Scripture, it is that Israel is the seed line that leads to the Messiah who will rule the world. According to Romans chapter 9, verse 5, when Paul's talking about all these great blessings that God has given to Israel— he says, from them, from Israel, by physical descent came the Messiah. So that's very significant. As a matter of fact, we're told in Matthew 1.1 1, 1, that Jesus is son of David, son of Abraham. According to Genesis 49, there's going to be a descendant of Judah for, to whom will be the obedience of the peoples, and he will bring prosperity to the earth. According to Numbers 24, verses 17 to 19, there's going to be a star that comes forth from Jacob, and a scepter shall rise from Israel. And according to verse 19, one from Jacob shall have dominion. So you have all these texts uh, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, predicting that there's going to be this Messiah, whom we now know is Jesus, who's going to be the Savior. He's going to be the ruler. He's going to be the one who brings victory over enemies. He's going to be the one who restores creation and the earth. Now, we mentioned before that Israel is a servant of God. There's no doubt about it. Israel as is a corporate national entity, entity is a servant of God. But there's also passages in Isaiah, like Isaiah 49, which talk about Jesus as the ultimate servant of Israel. So in addition to Israel as a nation being a servant, there ends up being this ultimate person, uh, this ultimate Israelite who will save sinful Israel and bless the world and bless the Gentiles. And we see that in Isaiah chapter 49, where the ultimate servant of Israel, who we now believe is Jesus, will restore the nation Israel and bring light to the nations and the Gentiles. According to Isaiah 49 verse 6, it says, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant. So God tells the servant, uh, you know, it's too small of a thing to just have you stop with restoring Israel. So it's too small of a thing that you should be my servant to raise up 
the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Now, again, remember the purpose of Israel as a nation was to bless the nations and the families of the earth, but Israel is sinful. And therefore there ends up being this Messiah from Israel, this ultimate Israelite who's going to take it upon himself to restore the nation of Israel and bring blessings to the Gentiles. And he also will be the one who will restore the nation so that the nation can function as it was intended to be. Uh, we know from Romans chapter 15, verses 8 to 9, as we're in the New Testament now, that Paul says that Christ has become a servant to the circumcision. Who's the circumcision? I refer to the Jewish people, the people of Israel. Christ has become a servant to the circumcision on behalf of the truth of God to what? To confirm the promises given to the fathers. That's very significant. The promises of the Old Testament to the nation of Israel don't just evaporate. They don't just vanish away. Jesus has come to confirm the promises given to the fathers. So he comes to literally fulfill and to bring about through his two comings the things that were promised to Israel. But notice what he also does. He comes what? For the Gentiles so that the Gentiles can glorify God for his mercy as it is written. Therefore, I will give uh, I will give praise to you among the Gentiles, and I will sing to your name. So Romans 15, 8 to 9 is a lot like Isaiah 49, where you end up having the ultimate servant, Jesus the Messiah, who uh, brings fulfillment to the promises to Israel, and he also blesses the Gentiles, which is really exactly what Genesis 12, 2 to 3 predicted would happen in the first place. Uh, in Luke chapter 2, verse 32, Jesus is referred to as one who would bring a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. So we see the Messiah not only blesses Israel, but he also blesses the Gentiles. And then third, uh, as we talked about before early on, according to Romans chapter 3, verses 1 to 2, Israel ends up being the vehicle that God uses for the giving of the scriptures. We're told then what advantage has the Jew or what is the benefit of circumcision? Great in every respect. First of all, that they were entrusted with the oracles of God. So it ends up being uh, the, the prophets, and then eventually in the New Testament with the apostles. Of course, we understand uh, Luke is a Gentile as he's involved with, uh, the, uh, with the gospel of Luke and, and Acts. But overall, it's accurate to say that God has chosen Israel uh, to grant the scriptures, and that's, that's a very great blessing. And then fourth, when it comes to purposes of Israel, we do believe that Israel, and with particular emphasis on the capital city of Israel, Jerusalem, is going to be the geographical capital of Messiah's kingdom when he reigns over the nations upon the earth. So you have all kinds of passages in scripture that talk about when Israel is saved and restored and gathered again after being scattered, uh, that the people of Israel are going to be significant. The capital city of Jerusalem is going to be the center for God's uh, declarations and decisions that will being made will be made according to Isaiah chapter 14 verse 1 when the Lord will have compassion on Jacob and again choose Israel and settle them in their own land then strangers will join them and attach themselves to the house of Jacob so that's talking about Gentile participation in the kingdom of God when Israel is restored again. If you read Zechariah chapter 14, there ends up being an attack on uh, Jerusalem and Israel, and then the Lord returns to deliver Israel. Uh, we're told that when he comes again to the Mount of Olives, according to verse 9, that the Lord will be king over all the earth, and in that day the Lord will be the only one, and his name the only one. So let that sink in that when the Messiah comes again, notice the Lord will be king over all the earth. So this is an earthly kingdom, but then this earthly kingdom has a capital. It ends up being Jerusalem, the capital city of Israel. Then it will come about, according to verse 16, that any who are left of all the nations that went against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the Feast of Booths. And so Jerusalem uh, is the capital, that, that city that was under siege, according to the first few verses of Zechariah 14 is going to be the capital of Messiah's kingdom when he reigns from and over the earth, and then the nations will be required to worship him there. According to Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 to 4, we're told that Messiah is going to rule from Jerusalem, and he's going to bring uh, international harmony. Now, I'm not going to read uh, everything that is here, but we are told that when it comes uh, 
uh, to Jerusalem. We're, we're, you notice that we're in the middle of verse three. We're told that the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And this is going to be the, the center of the kingdom that's talked about in the first two verses. We are told in verse three that many peoples will come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, that we may walk in his paths, for the Lord will go forth uh, for the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So notice you have this, this earthly kingdom capital from Jerusalem where uh, the nations are uh, understanding the significance of it. They, they, they want to be there to worship the Lord. And, and then as a result of this, there ends up being international harmony. Verse 4 says that he will judge between the nations and will render decisions for many peoples. So when Jesus comes again, he's actually going to rule the nations. Did you know that Revelation 19, 15 says that when Jesus comes again at his second coming, that he will rule the nations with a rod of iron? And we see this in Isaiah 2. Notice the international harmony here. They, the nations, will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they learn war. So when you look at Isaiah chapter 2, there is a earthly kingdom where the capital city is Jerusalem. Decisions are being made by the Lord, by the Messiah, and the nations are uh, involved with worship. So this shows a tangible earthly kingdom where Israel and Jerusalem are significant. Uh, according to uh, Zechariah chapter 8, there's some uh, significant statements here. In verse 13, we're told that it will come about that just as you were a curse among the nations, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so I will save you that you may become a blessing. So again, that goes all the way back to the promise of Genesis 12, 3, that Abraham and Israel would be, a, would be a blessing. Now we know Israel as a nation failed their mission in the Old Testament. And according to Jesus in Luke 19, 41 to 44, when Jesus came, Israel missed its day of visitation. And as a result, there was judgment. There was the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. There was the continuing of the times of the Gentiles that Jesus predicted in Luke uh, 21, uh, verse 24. But there's going to come a day where the Israel that has been scattered and judged because of disobedience is going to be gathered. And notice that when that occurs, God says that Israel will become a blessing among the nations. Notice according to verses 20 to 23 of Zechariah 8, thus says the Lord of hosts, it will yet be that peoples will come, even the inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one will go to another, saying, Let us go at once to entreat the favor of the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will also go. And notice verse 22. So many peoples and mighty nations, what will they do? They will come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days, 10 men from all the nations will grasp the garment of a Jew, saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. So again, that goes to show that when Jesus comes again and he reigns upon the earth, that the nations are going to be seeking him as nations. Now, in this era, we have people from different ethnicities and nations who serve the Lord. And no matter where anybody is at on earth, they, they have uh, the presence of Jesus and of the Holy Spirit. But this is describing a time where the Lord is going to reign upon the earth, and then the nations as nations are going to be impacted in a positive way. I also wanted to mention Romans chapter 11, uh, verses 12 to 15. Uh, I like to call these texts, you ain't seen nothing yet texts, because uh, it emphasizes that great blessings have come to the world in this age, even while Israel's in unbelief. But when Israel's fullness comes, there's going to be an era of even greater blessings for the world. So in Romans chapter 11, verse 12, Paul says that if their transgression, Israel's transgression, if their transgression is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, notice this, how much more will their fullness be? Again, that's the, you ain't seen nothing yet. In this age, God, with his uh, sovereignty and magnificence and everything that is great about him, has used Israel's sin and transgression to bless the world. If you're a Gentile believer like I am, there's been so many blessings that have been poured out upon you and upon other Gentiles who have believed. God has actually used Israel's unbelief and transgression to bless the world. But notice, how much more will their fullness be? And what's that fullness? That's the fullness that comes with the salvation of all Israel. That's talked about in Romans eleven twenty six. 26. All Israel will be saved. When all Israel is saved, that is connected with the kingdom of God on earth. 
Not only will you have people from nations getting saved, but nations themselves will be saved. Nations with their culture and society and the political realm and all those things will, will bring glory to God during that particular time. So the world's going to get even better. Notice verse 15, Paul says, for if their rejection, Israel's rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? So there's a little bit of debate what life from the dead means, whether that refers to resurrection, uh, does, it re does it refer to kingdom blessings? I actually think it could involve both. But again, it's talking about the world becoming an even better place when Israel transitions from unbelief to belief. And then fifth, the fifth purpose of Israel that we want to mention, uh, I feel like we do need to note this, is because you know Israel is a nation that because of Israel's disobedience has been scattered to the nations, and we know from the history of Israel, has gone through lots of tribulations and trials. But God has almost so promised that he is going to prove himself holy among the nations as he gathers scattered Israel. So if you look in Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 41, we're told, as a soothing aroma, I will accept you when I bring you out from the peoples and gather you from the lands where you are scattered. And then notice this, and I will prove myself holy among you in the sight of the nations. Let that sink in. I will prove myself holy among you in the sight of the nations. So as God gathers Israel who has been scattered, God is proving himself holy because of his covenant commitment to the nation of Israel. Verse 42 then goes on to say, and you will know that I am the Lord when I bring you into the land of Israel, into the land which I swore to give to your forefathers. And then notice what happens in verse 25 and following. Thus says the Lord God, when I gather the house of Israel from the peoples among whom they are scattered and will manifest my holiness in them in the sight of the nations, then they will live in their land, which I gave to my servant Jacob. They will live in it securely, et cetera, et cetera. So again, this is another statement here that when God gathers Israel from the peoples, that this will what manifest my holiness in them in the sight of the nations. So we felt like we had to point that out, that God is manifesting his holiness among the nations with how he treats Israel. So that ends up being an important purpose related to Israel. Now, when it comes to this Israel being gathered again after being scattered, how does that end up being fulfilled? It is through Jesus, the ultimate Israelite who saves Israel and restores Israel. So it's not because Israel is so great in and of itself, but it ends up being because of the ultimate Israelite. And again, that goes back to Isaiah 49 and Romans 15, that it takes the ultimate Israelite, Jesus the Messiah, to save and restore the nation of Israel and also bring uh, blessings to the Gentiles. So as a result of Jesus, there's the restoration of Israel. And it's also will involve the nations who can function for the glory of God in a righteous earthly kingdom for the glory of God. So when we put that all together, we see that there are five purposes in Scripture uh, concerning Israel. What are those five? Number one, Israel is central to God's plans to bless the world. That involves the defeat of evil, the reverse of the curse, the restoration of the earth, the bringing of salvation and reconciliation with God, and then the defeat of death. And then second, and very importantly, Israel is the seed line that leads to the Messiah who will save and rule the world. Number three, Israel is the vehicle for the scriptures. Number four, Israel will be the geographical capital of Messiah's coming kingdom. And then number five, the one purpose of Israel is to show the nations God's holiness. So now we're not saying that there couldn't be other purposes, but those are the five that we see in scripture. And again, when we're, we are dealing with the entity of Israel, we don't want to overemphasize Israel or underemphasize Israel. We want to give Israel the significance that the scripture gives it. And what we've seen from our lesson today is that there are several significant purposes that God has for the nation Israel. And again, we want to reaffirm that all of that is centered on the perfect and ultimate and true Israelite, Jesus the Messiah, who saves and restores Israel and brings blessings to the world, not only spiritually, but ultimately with his second coming materially, physically, and involves all aspects of creation.